again, my name is Steve Gerhardt. Uh, I do a little channel online, YouTube, called the Unagi Observer. do different uh, reviews and things like that, uh, talk about cultural stuff, uh, things that interest me. So if you ever get a chance, go on YouTube, check my, my channel out. I would appreciate it. Uh, today is about Shigeru Mizuki, who is a storyteller extraordinaire, and he is a master of yokai. Uh, pretty much what I just want to talk about is his uh, life a little bit and impact on uh, probably three, to me, three of his most powerful works that, 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 that are that in my, in my uh, estimation. Um, one of the things, make sure I get this in the right direction. This is a contemporary, you might recognize him, Osamu Tezuka, the godfather of manga. Um, the reason why I bring them up is because they are actually contemporaries. Shigeru Mizuki and Osama, um, Osamu Tezuko were literally born within 10 miles of each other. He's, he's actually about six years younger than Shigeru. But it's just, I wanted to point out how sometimes in history or in, in times in, in, in creation of things, new things, people tend to somehow be in the same geographical area sometimes. And so these guys were pretty close to each other geographically. And as they moved around in Japan during their careers, they never really strayed that far from each other. I just wanted to, just to bring that, that up. Um, this is, uh, yep, this is Shigeru Mizuki at age 18. He was born in Osaka itself, uh, March 8th, 1922. But he actually lived right outside in a suburb called, uh, probably gonna get this right or wrong, Sakai Minato. And like I said, he was a kind of a contemporary at that time of Tezuka. And this is him at age three. And if he looks like a troublemaker, it's because he was. And um, he, uh, his real name is actually Shigeru Miura. Uh, and he got a nickname called Gege Gege because when they tried to get him to speak his own name, he couldn't pronounce it. That was the best he could do. And so he later in life just said, yep, that's me. That's me. And he just took it on as, as his nickname. And um, he had in his family life uh, an older and a younger brother. Uh, his parents were financially secure, they weren't necessarily poor, they weren't rich, um, they, they had stable jobs, you know, his mother stayed at home and did what was expected of Japanese women in the 20s and 30s, you know, take care of the house, cook groceries, uh, if she wanted something to, to have a little bit of her own money, they were allowed to do a little odd jobs here and there, but here and there, watch the other neighbor's kids, kind of things like that. His father was considered to be an intellectual, um, he just did a lot of different jobs. Uh, he didn't really settle on any one thing for very long, except he was a projectionist, which in Japan at that time was a very new thing. And so the theaters as we know today are not the same as they were back then. Even for American standards, even in the 20s and 30s, it was still not the same thing. It was literally just like a room, and someone set up a projector, and they just cranked it up. And that was literally what he did. But he was popular, so his father was able to you know, make enough money so that they, they were doing all right. Uh, his brothers did very well. In, well, they didn't do very well in school, but they studied really hard. Uh, Shigeru, not so much. He was really a poor student. And it was his hope by his parents that his brothers would take care of him. They, they just gave up on him. Mm -hmm. And they just said, you, you're, you, you don't go to school, you don't, you're not, you don't do that well at it, so hopefully your brothers will take you in as family and make sure you don't die of starvation or something stupid. Mm -hmm. And, but then he started developing, like, drawing pictures, and people started noticing at such a young age that he was actually really kind of good at it. And his father noticed it, and his father basically encouraged him to draw, to be artistic, to express himself in this fashion, and because his father was very artistic in, in, in terms of not skill and ability, but 
he enjoyed it. He was very knowledgeable, not just of Japanese uh, art, but also of Western art. So it was, it was of interest to him, and he was happy to see at least there was something that his middle kid could do. <laughs> and um, so one of the four things at this time in his life, between age three and you know when he got to high school, or he didn't really get to high school, um, was that first he was, like I said, a poor student. He literally would not get up in the morning to go to his first class. He never made it to his first class, and that's why he claims in interviews that he was horrible at math, because that was the first class, and he just could not get out of bed. It's like much like this morning, where I didn't want to get out of bed because it was just gray out there. But for him, he just didn't do it, and the culture at that time was that parents didn't really make you do things as long as you were doing something else at that time that was productive. So they kind of just gave up on him getting to his first class. He would eventually make it to school, but even at school, he had a, he just really wasn't a good student. He Part of the reason was that he would later on say is because he didn't really respect his teacher's authority. And that is a common theme for Shigeru's life, is that he, he, has, he had real problems with authority. Um, and, and by that I don't mean he was a rebel or anything like that, but he just, when it came down to very strict authoritarian types of things, he didn't buy into it. Uh, the second thing that he was known for at that age was beating the crap out of people. Uh, he was a scrapper. He, he, he jumped into fights, he loved fighting. He, one of his favorite games was war with other boys, so he'd be part of an army. And he, oddly enough, rose in this child army to be a leader. And when he finally was going to school, more or less, uh, he would do the prison thing and he would pick out the biggest guy and go after him. And he usually actually won. Um, so he was really good in a fight. Uh, the third thing that he was really good, uh, that, that is known about him at this time, was his ability, his artistic ability. And his drawings, unfortunately, it's very hard to find his early drawings right now because a lot of it was destroyed. But it has been compared to um, Albrecht Dürer, who's a German artist who's very detailed, um, just fantastic ink prints, um, metal stenciling where it's just very clear and it's very detailed and it's very sharp and he and he was able to do that by hand like he was able to produce that kind of quality to the point where his teachers who more or less gave up on him anything academic saw this and like his father encouraged him in this and they even opened up periodically exhibitions of his own work keep in mind this is like a, a, a 10 to 12 year old kid getting his own exhibition. That's how good he was. The last thing that he was known for in his, actually, in this time period and throughout the rest of his life, was he had a unusually strong stomach and digestive tract. He could eat anything, literally, anything. And that actually saved his life at one point later on. But as a kid, he would get hungry and he would see something that uh, would appeal to him and he would eat it. There's a story that he like he used to tell where he said that there was, you know, they played with these wooden balls. There was one particular wooden ball that was gold colored, that was painted gold. And he said, wow, that looks kind of good. And so he picked up this wooden ball and for the next few days just wore it down like a jawbreaker and just ate this wooden ball. So he would eat anything, anything. Now, um, it was about this time in his life, as he grew a little bit older, from age three, you know, like around eight or nine, ten years old, his parents, um, the boys were old enough that they could leave the house, but they wanted the house to be taken care of. So they hired this, what we would call a governess or a nanny. And this woman was named uh, Fusa Kajiyama. And the nickname she had was Nananwa. And uh, that is uh, one of the many covers that you can find of this. That's really, I mean, this is one of the books that I think is, is really representative of his, of his work. And the reason why this woman is 
so important is that she's the one who really got him into yokai. Um, yokai, and I'll explain what that, what that is in a, in a moment. Um, this book was written in, was it 77, 1977? And it's a kind of sort of autobiography of his life at that time. And it's, it's he even refers to himself in the book, Gay Gay. And uh, it's more or less autobiograph autobiographical. And um, it's really about him and his relationship with this woman, Nona Bob. So who was she? Well, we know her name, Fusi uh, Kajiyama, his nanny. And she was also what was called a prayer woman. In the 20s and before, um, there would be these low-level priests, acolytes of both Buddhism and Shinto, where these people would walk around into a village and offer prayers for the sick, offer to stand over them if someone, if a loved one was dying, like an old person was dying, um, things like that. And it was the hope that if the person was sick, that these prayers would help. And if they were dying, these prayers would help them move on to the next life in a good fashion. So if you're a Buddhist, hopefully that would bring you forward into your next life in a good position. Or if you were Shinto, this would be for the other spirits to help you, guide you on your journey into, into heaven or possibly become a spirit yourself. Uh, now, that's more or less what the prayer, what, what the priest did. Now, he had a, an assistant, the prayer woman, who would assist him in this. She was actually more functional of the pair. She was, these women were versed in an apothecary. So they actually knew a few things about herbs, um, medical lore, and so they were actually kind of useful in that they were able to provide some type of medicine and to, to help. And they made really good housekeepers as a result. So what would happen is that if, a, if the priest died and you had a prayer woman in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon for a family to take them in, hire them as a nanny as for kids, if they had kids, or to take care of the house. And they would still be allowed to be, go from time to time to other places and help out other families in, in that sense. Now, the other thing about these, these prayer women was that they had an extraordinarily large knowledge of the yoga. And so when Shigeru was basically um, being raised by her, more or less, she would tell him all these stories about yokai, all about, all about these demons, um, divine entities, all these kinds of things. Um, partially to, to explain the world to him. What does death mean? That, and that's one of the things about Nanobot is that it explores how uh, he learns about death, how he learns about life, how he learns about love, how he learns how to go through, go through life, when it's time to fight, when it's not time. And it's all through, these, through this woman who teaches him these things. And she uses, when he's younger, the idea of the yokai with that. And... Um, so the yokai are basically, it, in Japan, if you were to take all the divine beings, spirits, uh, gods, um, everything, if you were to, to do a compendium of them, you would have around seven to eight million different kinds of beings. The yokai are pretty much on the lower end of that. They're, they're very minor beings, and, they're, and quite frankly, they are, like for people like Nanaba, if they're dealing with someone difficult like Shigeru, they'd be like, in this instance, she's telling him, come on, you gotta keep moving, you gotta keep walking, you can't lollygag, or else this guy's gonna get you. Well, who is this guy? So she makes up a story about who this demon is and how he gets you and how you avoid being gotten by him. The thing is, is that while there are stories like that, there are people who actually believe that there are yokai, actual yokai, and these are really minor mystical beings. Uh, they can be anywhere from like something like this to, oh, there's a water stain on the wall, so the yokai of this wall, just this wall, is upset with you, and that's why there's this water stain. So it's to help to explain the unexplainable. And because she had such good knowledge of this, and there's such amazing knowledge of this, 
he was always enthralled by these stories, and he really bought into it. And later in life, he even said that that there are, while there most of it are stories, he firmly believed that yokai were real, that there was some level of realism to this. Um, and so what he did, because he enjoyed these stories so much, is he started drawing them. And then he would show them to Nanamba, and Nanamba would look at him and go, oh yes, this is exactly what I think this yokai should look like. That's exactly right. And then he went forward from just drawing a picture of what she described to actually making stories. So he was a huge, she was a huge influence early on for him to do things like comics, manga, uh, Kashiban, things like that. Uh, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. So it was based on these experiences that he can't get, this is another one of many covers that you can find, um, that he finally wrote Nanamba in 1977. And it was actually in response to an essay when someone said, why, are you, why do you have such interest in yokai? And he brought up Nanamba. And he got the idea from that essay, well, why don't I just go ahead and draw this and make this a book so people can understand. That's what he did. And it, it was pretty popular. Only a manga cop. Well, What's that? Only a manga cop. You ask yeah. a question, I'll just draw a whole your novel about it. Right. Gosh. <laughs> um, the Warriors. Mm. Um, so, Shigeru grew up in the 20s and 30s. And it was during this time that Japan was experiencing military expansion. In the 20s, not that they were conquering, but they were flexing their muscles. They were seeing what they could do, seeing what worked, what didn't work technologically, tactics, the whole nine yards. They were part of the Boxer Rebellion, which is in the early 1900s. And any kind of small conflict you can think of during this time period, they were involved in in some way, shape, or form. They were even involved in World War I at one point um, in the Russian front. And so the, all this cumulative knowledge was on purpose to, and it's, it was actually much like what Hitler did with German involvement in Spain. They were learning how to use what they had and what worked and what didn't work. As this was happening in Shakira's life in Japan in the 1920s, here's how kind of school worked. You went through school up to a point, and then you had to take an exam. And that exam allowed you to go further in life whether that be high school and then you take another exam, whether it gets you into college, what type of college, things like that. More often than not, children made it past elementary school, but then they would go into a trade. And that was quite, that, that was quite common. You go into whatever trade your parents did or whether your uncle did, you were shipped off somewhere or whatever. If you did not have a trade to go to, which was a lot of kids, they were very young, we're talking 17, 18 years old, they would go into the army. They would go into the military, and they would start experiencing the military at this time. Shigeru never did that. He, he never went into the army. That was not his thing because he was, quite frankly, lazy. He really didn't do well in school because he didn't like the authority. He didn't like doing the work. And he, you know, he had jobs, but he didn't really come through with them because you know, he didn't, didn't want to work. So the army was the last thing he was going to do. Then, unfortunately, World War II happened. And that changed his life, life in a very horrible, horrific way. Um, so at age 20, in 1942, we're in the middle of World War II. Um, it's a struggle right now for both Japan and the United States. And Shihiro is finally drafted into the army at age 20. Uh, by the way, that's his father next to him. And to give you an idea of what army life in Japan was like, the Japanese army, it was miserable. Uh, think Arlie Emery from Metal Jack, Full Metal Jacket when he's screaming at guys. Multiply that times 100 with physical abuse, and that's an average day in the Japanese army at this time. And the worst of them were, of course, the non-commissioned officers, which were the corporals, and more, more horrifically, the sergeants. These guys, you could just be standing there, you'd be perfect, doing everything perfect, and they would come up and just slap you. No reason. Just to make sure that you knew where, what your place was, where you were in this world. And 
Shigeru being Shigeru, <laughs> didn't like it. And he was a very, and much like being a poor student, being a poor worker, he was a poor uh, military man. Um, so what they did is they said, finally, they gave up on him, and they said, here's a bugle, you get to be a trumpeter. And what that meant at that time in the home islands of Japan was that you would literally, whatever base you're stationed at, if you had to do on the hour, on the hour, you know, do the, do the bugle. Or if a dignitary was coming, you'd have to run over and do the bugle. If you had to do the, it, he's always running around and blowing into his bugle. And he hated it because he was running around having to blow his bugle. So he, he really didn't like it. So he went to his officer and said, I would like to transfer. And the officer said, yes, of course, we will transfer you. North or south? This is how the story goes. <laughs> North or south? She goes, well, kind of like it where it's warm. I don't like the cold. So I'll go south. Like, all right, south you go. To New Papua New, uh, Papua New Guinea, which is the front line of the fighting with the Australians and the, and, and the Americans. So he just made a really bad choice, and not that he had a really good choice, but he, made, but he just made his life worse by doing the one thing he did not want to do. Um, and this is where it gets serious uh, for him. When he died, his daughter, Shigeru, when Shigeru uh, died, uh, in 2015, his daughter went through his belongings and they found this manuscript. It was about 38 pages long. No one knew about it. No one knew he had it. No one knew what was in it. And she read it. And so I'm going to read. It's, it's not this page. This is the actual manuscript. But I'm going to read this and it's going to give you an idea of how, where Chihiro was in 1942, just as he was about to be transferred to the front lines. And this is a quote from it. 50 to 100,000 men are dying in this war every day. At what point are the arts? At what point is religion? We aren't even permitted to contemplate these things. To be a painter, a philosopher, or a scholar of letters, all that is needed are laborers. This is an age painted with earth tones of graveyards an age of buried humanity where people are just lumps under the earth. I sometimes think being alive at this time is the only thing worse than death. Everything of worth has been discarded. Where it remains is violence, political authority. That's what kills us. I have no, capa have no more capacity for tears. My only relief is to lose myself in music and painting. I turn pale at the thought of war, but that's how I win. October 6, 1942. He's a fun-loving guy. Everyone likes being around him. He hates this. This is the most terrible thing in his life. And he's about to embark on the most terrible thing in his life, which is war. He's convinced that he is going to die. He does not want to die. And because the worst of it, which this passage is reminiscent of, is that this war is not worth it. This should not be happening. We should not be dying for this. And the only comfort that I have, the only thing I can rely on, is the art that I draw, the things that I can look at and enjoy, and hold in my head as I, as I feel that I'm going on to my death. He really believed that he was dead. These manuscripts said, he, I'm going to die. I'm not coming back home. And this is his despair. And so when he gets to Papua New Guinea, he's pretty much right, except for the death part. He, he doesn't die, obviously. But uh, this is from Onward oh, to Towards Our Noble Death. And it's just, fortunately for him, his unit does not come into that much contact with Allied forces. He does a lot of patrols, they march around a lot, but the contact is very limited. As a matter of fact, he only talks about two instances. And one of the instances is that um, a Allied patrol, we think it was American, spotted his unit and came up behind them and slaughtered everyone but him. So all his friends are dead. So everyone he came with are dead, they're gone. He's lost. So he goes back, he's reassigned to another unit, they stay there, of course do the same thing, patrols, and contracts, malaria. 
and he's in the hospital. And malaria is 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 a disease that that is really third world at this point. We don't really have to worry about it that much. Back then in the 40s, no matter who you were in the world, malaria was a big deal. You, that's something you died from. So malaria, he's got malaria, he's, he's, he's laying in the hospital, he's wasting away, he's got the high fevers, everything that's going wrong, misery, and he's basically dying. And in the hospital, they only have so many supplies because the war is starting to turn against Japan at this point. And so they're limited in their supplies. They're looking at Shigeru. The doctors are looking at him. And they say, he is a lost cause. We need to save our food and our medicine for those who are going to eat, who are going to try to live. Shigeru, now when they're saying this, Shigeru's laying right there, and they're standing right here. So he's laying on, his, on what he thinks is his deathbed. He hears this, and he's like, no, I don't want to die. He sits up as the story goes, and he starts grabbing things and eats them. The rubber tubing from the IV, the you know, gauze, whatever. He's like, look, I can eat, I can eat, I can eat. And they're like, okay, fine. <laughs> so they, they keep up with his medicine and his food, and he starts to recover. And he's more or less recovering. He's still got some of the fever. He's, he's about to be released, and it is believed that it was an Australian bombing run that bomb the hospital that he was in. And uh, he, so pretty much everyone inside the hospital is killed except for him. And when he comes to, he is missing his left arm from the elbow down. So there's a stump here. And it's a badly sewn stump, it's infected. Uh, it's, you know, they, they actually have to clean maggots off of it all the time. And so he's horrified because he's left-handed. That's his drawing hand. So he's been an artist his entire life. This is his thing. This is what gives him comfort. He can no longer do it. His arm is gone. And so when he, and of course he's the sole survivor of the, practically the sole survivor of this bombing. So he is wandering around Papua New Guinea, literally. And he comes across this tribe called the Teloi where he befriends them, and the story he says is that he just walked in and started eating everything, and a family adopted him. Um, that actually sounds right, um, honestly. But he, but he goes in there, they adopt him, they kind of help him out a little bit, you know, you know, regain hope and those kinds of things, and he decides right then and there, he's gonna stay here, he's never going back to Japan, he can't go back to Japan, he doesn't want to face his family, he does want to face the people back there, because I'll explain that in a minute why. And he's finding comfort here. They're allowing him to be him. And he is even offered citizenship at one point through marriage. So they're about to allow him to say, hey, we like you too. We want you to stay. So he's feeling, for the first time in a long time, a sense of purpose, love, connection. The doctor comes up to him and says, don't be an idiot. You have to go back to Japan. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Because if you don't, you're going to die of that wound. Why am I going to die of that wound? Because the guy who, who amputated your arm and sewed it up and did a really horrible job of it, and the reason why you're constantly in a fever and you're about to die of it, was a dentist. <laughs> the only medical professional after the bombing left was a dentist who did the amputation, sewed up the arm, so he, did, he botched it. And the only way that they were going to be able to save Shikiro was to send him back Japan, which is really the last thing he wanted to do. Um, um, get the guitar in a moment. So, anyway, I'll stand up and show you this one. So this is the book that he wrote in 73. It's called Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths. Much like Nan and Ba, this is more or less autobiographical. It has a different ending than his. I'll just leave it at that. But it talks about everything that I just talked about. So um, this is 
one of his works that got him a lot of awards and kind of put him on the map, more or less. And if you ever want, um, I know you mentioned this in some of your panels, Great with the Fireflies, which is a huge pacifist film. This is a pacifist book. Um, I cannot tell you enough that you should go out to your library like I did in that crap library, get this book, and just give yourself time and look at every frame, look at every, every panel, and enjoy it. Because you're going to see elements not only of the story, the pacifism, but you're going to see his ability in there. Because there's going to be parts of it where it's cartoonish, like I was showing in the, in, in, on the picture up here. But then you have amazingly detailed jungle scenes where at first you look at it and you're like, wow, this is a really great scene. Then you look closer and you go, wow, I can actually see the veins on those leaves. And keep in mind that this is after retraining his right arm to do what his left arm used to do. So, definitely. Take a look at that. Now, for the Japanese, um, when you go back home in World War II, for a Japanese soldier, it was a really tough time because you came home in defeat. And it's bad enough that you lived through, or it's bad enough that you're wounded, that you're maimed, and you come back home. Because people will look at you and they would say, this, this is honest, this is what happened. Some of the population would look at you and go, you didn't do enough. And this is why you lost your arm, because you didn't try hard enough. This is your fault. We lost because of you. Because you didn't try hard enough. He did not want to face that. Families who take back their people, their their sons maimed. This is harsh. Some of them would have preferred them to have been killed, because the parents have to live with the shame that you failed. And it would be better off if the family could turn around and say, "Yes, we lost the war, but my son died, which means that he gave the ultimate sacrifice. He tried, but because he was maimed and he survived, they." It's felt that he did not try hard enough. So that's one of the reasons why he didn't want to come back. When soldiers came back and they're not maimed, they're not wounded, they're perfectly healthy, but they've lost the war, that's even worse. You didn't try hard enough. You did not try hard enough. What was worse for Shigeru was two things. One from outside of Japan and one from inside of Japan. Inside of Japan, because of his attitude about the war to begin with, what he experienced, which justified his attitude, and he became an avowed pacifist. War is wrong. In 1945 Japan, when you say that, not only did you not try hard enough, not only did you come back maimed and you're alive, you're a defeatist. That's why we lost. We lost because of people like you. So he chose a hard path. The other part of it was that his older brother was classified as a Class B war criminal. His older brother was had to serve his time in jail. He was not executed, but his older brother was an artillery was part of an artillery unit that captured a group of Americans early on in the war. And at, by the end of it, this was not unusual for officers to make this order. Um, had them all killed, and so his brother was was considered to be a war criminal. And so, in terms of Japan, this is going to sound weird, the Japanese, while they were not thrilled with his older brother being a war criminal, they didn't isolate him. He wasn't, he wasn't a pariah. They, he, wasn't, he wasn't celebrated, but he wasn't denied things. He wasn't denied a job because he killed helpless people. They, they thought that was part of what he did. So. He had to go through all this. He had to retrain his arm, and so to, to draw, and that was only to come for himself. That was not to make money. So in order to make money, in order to leave this all behind him, he went and decided to become, well, what's, what's the least amount of work I can do that I know of, make money, and stay out of people's way? I'll be a landlord. So he buys Mizuki Manor. That's where he gets his last name, Mizuki. So he changes his name from Mura to Mizuki. Um, okay. 
And bring that picture up. Yeah. There it is. Empty sleeve. Right there. This was taken about the time that he actually started um, doing things for um, cashew bonds. But before this, like I said, he was a landlord. And to supplement his income, because that wasn't enough, he did art for things called, I think I'm going to be um, saying this incorrectly, Kami Shabai. Now, Kami Shabai, these guys have been doing this for years, for centuries. And what they're entertainers. And what they do is they walk around and they have these little tiny, um, you know, like theaters right here, and what they do is they find a corner that they see a lot of people walking by. Mm -hmm. They put down a bowl and they wait for parents to come by and with their kids or maybe even adults, and they start throwing coins in there. And once he feels that he has enough, he starts to tell a story. And so as he's telling this story, you know, in a very interject fashion, you can see this guy, he changes out the pictures as he's going along with the story. And it was a very cheap way of entertainment. Because at this time in post World War II, there is they're wrecked. Their economy is done. It's it's everything is is just destroyed. There's not a whole lot of resources to like movies. You know, only the rich can afford movies. Um, you can't really. There, there was really no manga at that time. So this is kind of the best form of television. Forget about it. Way out of anybody's price range. So when you're a parent and you're walking down the street and you see this. This is 30 to 60 minutes worth of, of nap time for you, so you can just bring your kids, sit them down, and you know have a story be told to them. So Shigeru Mizuki started after he started after he rehabbed his right hand, started drawing these these picture cards as supplementary income. And as he did that, he got better and he got better and he got better. But and and as time went on, he would actually get married. And have kids. So even though he was doing the, the Kami Shabai work, and even though he was a landlord, he had kids now, and he has a wife, and he needs more money. So finally, he does, goes into the practice of um, of the Kashiban. What is a what is a Kashiban? Kashiban, again, there was no real manga at that time in terms of what we know it today, where you could just go in and buy books or magazines that showed a serial. Uh, story of, of, of manga. So what you had to do is you actually had to go to these places that were kind of like a library, but you had to pay for it. So you go in and you see the book that you want to read, the comic that you want to read, and you would pay for it. So you know, like a week's worth would equal however much it was. So you put your money down and you, you took the book. And if you were late with it, of course there were late fees, just like renting a video back in Blockbuster back in the day. And so that's what he did for a very long time. Now, the publishers of these books, the way it worked was that the publisher would pay you a single fee to write and, and draw the book. They would go to the Kashibans because they were limited in the amount of paper that they could use, so that's why they only printed so many. And so each of these stores would get one or two copies, and the publisher would make royalties off of that, and the Kashibans would make their money right off the bat from kids or the adults coming to, to read the books. So who gets the short thrift? As usual, it's the artist, just like today. Uh, they, you know, they, they get the short end of the stick, they don't get paid that much, even though they're ones that, that is actually creating the biz, business for it. Um, so, but this was important because as he's doing this, he's actually, and this is actually one of, they actually exist today. Uh, which I was surprised at. There's not many of them, but this is kind of what, kind of what they look like a little bit. So see this guy? So this is a Kashiban right here. And this is the first iteration of Katara, or the graveyard. So what had happened was that uh, Shigeru's publisher went on vacation and went to a place where they say, "Oh, the spirits of this of this of this uh, spa will help you rejuvenate." And so he got onto his yokai kit, explored it, 
got really into it, uh, looked at uh, various historical books about it, and he saw this one legend, Kitaro of the Graveyard, that nobody had rights to. So he came back and he said to Shigeru, do this. Do this because nobody has rights to it. It's an amazing story. I love this yokai stuff. The kids are going to love it. Do it, write it, you know, draw it, go for it. And so he does, and this is what he comes up with, and it fails miserably. Nobody wants that. No kid wants to read that. I mean, look at it. It's just, you know, that's just almost horrific. Now, Guitar of the Graveyard is, um, sorry, I keep it here. Um, Guitar of the Graveyard is based on an actual legend that's very, that's very popular, not popular, but very well known in Japan. And it's called um, Ubemi. And what it is, it's a legend of dead mothers giving birth to live babies. There are supposed to be true stories of a woman dying, pregnant woman dying. They bury her, and then they hear crying in the graveyard. And they come back, and they find that a baby has been born from the dead mother, supposedly. Don't know if that's true or not. But the legends then grow on to being that the baby is rescued from the grave, but there's this spirit of the mother that keeps coming back, and this child grows up periodically finding candy or a yen or something next to their, to their bed or... You know, when they wake up at their desk or whatever, there's something there that their mother is looking out after them. So, Kitaro of the, of the Graveyard was, was based on this. And even though the Kashiban didn't work and he was struggling, that's when manga boomed. This was at the very beginning of, Japanese, of Japan's economic turnaround. So more resources are available, so they can actually do more paper, they can actually make magazines, they can make manga. And so he tries it again, Kotaro of the Graveyard, because he actually loves the story of it and thinks he can do a lot with it. And he created it as a manga, and it failed. Nobody liked it. The kids didn't want it. They didn't want to buy into it. And he was confused. He, he was just like, why, why don't people like this story? This is a great story. So he sat back and he said, well, let me take this new manga thing. And he starts buying all this different manga. And he's looking at it and he finally figures it out. Are you going to buy this? Or are you going to buy that? As a kid. Which is more friendly? This guy. So he figures it out. He figures out that he has to change his drawing. He figures out that he has to come up with a not-so-dark story. It can be dark, it can be gruesome, it can be gothic in certain ways, but it has to be for the kid. It has to be, it doesn't have to be the gruesome, oh, the mother gave birth in a grave. It can be, well, he's of yokai, and this is what he does. And you can talk about that and make it appealing to kids. And so in doing that, once he did that, it ballooned. It, it, I won't say that it went off like a rocket, but it was very solid. It was a very solid series for him. Do we know if canonically the new Kitaro was born of a dead mother? You know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, curious. yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, so he changed, um, he changed Kitaro to being more accessible uh, he's a powerful yokai. A lot of yokai are not anti-human, but they like to play tricks on humans like gremlins and things like that. So instead, when he did, because he said, well, Kotaro is a person that wants to build bridges between two worlds, between the yokai and, and men. And so he wants to get, do good deeds, and he wants to try and get his fellow yokai to be better, to be better spirits. And so he's, he's got a bunch of different spiritual powers. I mean, it's just so numerous, that, and part of it comes from that, that vast... The iconic vest. He is always wearing that vest. He is the last member of what's called the Ghost Tribe. Um, so he has all these different powers that he can sense other yokai. He can be strong when he needs to be. He can survive dismemberment. There's a lot of stories where he gets chopped up, but he comes back. Um, and the story, they changed the Ubami, Ubemi story to the fact that instead of being so graphic about being born in a graveyard and crawling out of a hole, they do a story of where his parents are yokai, 
and the mother is giving birth, but they're both sick with this disease, unknown disease that only affects yokai. And the, 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 this man discovers this, and then one day he comes back to visit them, and he finds that they're both dead, the parents are both dead, and there's this baby, Kataro, with just one eye laying there, and he adopts the kid, not really because he wants to, but because he feels like, well, it's a baby, so you know, I can't leave it here. And he raises Katara up to a certain point. Well, this is where it gets a little weird. Katara's father is, um, <laughs> is, as a yokai, a yokai expert. And his father loves him so much, so much, that he comes back to life, but not in the form as he was, which is a mummy, but as an eyeball. And the, the actual comic strip shows the eye popping out of the corpse's head, rolling onto the floor, and then suddenly a little body appears underneath the eyeball. And the eyeball starts walking around, and the guy, and, and it's his father, and he's going, I must help Kitaro, I must be with Kitaro, I must help him through this life because this human who did adopt him for a little while just doesn't like him and he's on his own and I have to help him. So I want to be with him and, and help him on his, on his journey. And so the rest of Kutaro is basically that, is, is basically him on this journey of bridging the, the human and the yokai world. And his father Helps him, and his father, by the way, loves tea baths. So you see this little eyeball in a, like a little teacup, <laughs> and you know, which is very disconcerting if you're not expecting that. You know, which is a quite often trope in this particular comic where someone will just like, ha ha, eyeball, <laughs> and you know, and then worse, the eyeball speaks to you and says hello, and and you know, that's not what anybody wants really, um, in their tea. And when he's not with Kitar or when he's with Kitaro and they're traveling, the best way for him to travel is to hop on his shoulder, go underneath the hair where the empty eye socket is, and just sit in the eyeball, in the eye socket. He just sits in there, and then when, he need, when he's needed, he pops out. So how would you like that? Have a 10-year-old kid come up to you, say hello, and then you hear another voice in the eyeball, just pops out and waves at you. So that's, that's kind of how the guitar does. Now, one of the, the, so this is one of the many, 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 many iterations of, of Kitaro stories. This one is, uh, the I think, one of the more recent ones. And it's a collection. Um, it's just called Kitaro. And it's a collection of the, some of the earlier stories. And it's and it's done by this group that, that um, is called literally Drawn and Quarterly. So they kind of do a little horror stuff like this. Um, I'll tell you if, if you if you want to experience Kitaro and you're not sure if this is something you want to get into, get one of these books, the, the larger ones, because there's no real there's very few overall story arcs. They're they're very just per per episode, so to speak, of adventures, but they're all different. They're all funny, um, and it's usually teaching a bad human or a bad yokai how to be a good person or a good yokai, and. Um, it's just it, it's 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 just a fun. It turns into a fun read, and this is what actually finally gave uh, Shigeru Mizuki the ability to do this full time. It's because everyone started buying into this. And one of the thing is is that a lot of people don't know this manga. They don't know this anime, but they know this 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 character. Mm -hmm. This is like if you walk into any vendor, you walk in that vendor room right over there, and you probably see a keychain or something of that nature, and you see this guy. So a lot of people know the image, they just don't know the character, which is a shame because it's this this character has been around for a long time, and I would say probably every 10, 15 years, a new movie, a new television show, a new um, OVA, something comes out related to uh, to uh, to Kitaro. and um, one of the biggest storylines, one of the few storylines, overarching storylines, has to do, and it's very interesting. And if you ever get a chance to read it, read it. It's called the Yokai War, and the Yokai War, and I think it's actually in this 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 uh, this collection right here. 
And it's very interesting because it's east meets west in a battle over an island, a Japanese island. And it's the eastern yokai, which is Kitaro and his friends, versus western yokai, who are Frankenstein, the Wolfman, Dracula, all, all, the, all, all the good guys, all, I mean, all the, all the good uh, old horror story guys. Um, and they come and they actually have a war over this one island. This one island comes, the, the humans come to Katara and say, please help us, please help us. Dracula is sucking our blood, the Wolfman's eating us, and Frankenstein is crushing our heads. So can you please come over here and tell your, fellow, your yokai from the Western, from America, please go away. And then it's just this huge battle ensues between his friends and them. And it's just, it's actually funny more than anything. It's just, just to see that. Um, so, and again, this kind of comes in, in, into play where here in America, we don't know Shigeru Mizuki that well. We don't know his work that well. We, you know, at best, we, we're familiar with this image but we really don't know it. In Japan, totally different. Totally different. There are entire streets named after his characters, after him. There are entire um, uh, towns that, that do this thing like this, where the entire one, where a dedicated street, where all his drawn yokai, there'll be some type of bronze statue like Kataro here, and there'll be a little plaque that describes it. There's even, I think, a sort of Playland, not quite an amusement park, but a, but a playland in his hometown. And everywhere you go in Japan, and you say the name Shigeru Mizuki, everybody knows who, you, who you're talking about. Um, sadly, he of course passed away, uh, 2015, at age 93. Um, he literally just tripped, fell on his head, was in was in the hospital for about a week and then he passed away. Um, which is an odd way, I think, for, or a fitting way, almost, way for a person to die of, of, of you know, his life, a person that he lived his life, life that way. He um, was very much throughout his life very anti-authoritarian, very against military, he's very against, he was totally a path, pacifist, he made fun of it whenever possible, Whenever politicians start getting, um, as, as one writer put it, whenever a politician started getting out of hand, he would actually start waving his stump <laughs> as if it was a finger pointing, accusing him, saying, hey, this is what you want? Because you'll get it if that's what you want. And so he, he was very upfront. He was always been described, he's, he's always been uh, energetic. That's one of the things that people love about him is that he's always been forward, forward, forward with what his thinking was, his philosophy. He put it in, into his artwork. He put it into the essays that he wrote. And he did this wonderful, for many, many decades, uh, circuit of storytelling where he would literally just be asked to come into a room, have a picture, and then he would just tell a story for the next hour and a half. And people would be completely engrossed with what he was saying. There was always a lesson to it, but it was not beaten, you were not beaten over the head with it. And it got to the point where the nation, uh, he, he won many awards. He won the Eisner Award uh, for his work. Um, he was given the Order of the uh, Rising Sun for advancing Japanese art outside of Japan, which was, which is kind of a big deal when you stop and think about it. Um, and he is named uh, a person of cultural merit in Japan, which basically means that he was a living treasure. Like the, the government said, you are an important resource to us. So he, he, he was very, uh, very well thought of in Japan. And I just always think it's a shame that he doesn't get that kind of recognition over here. And the last thing that I think is great about this guy, or what's great about this guy, is that hamburgers and french fries. He's all about it. <laughs> all about it. Like, he, you can find him anywhere. He'd be, wherever he is in the world, he'll find a hamburger joint. And eat the and eat French fries and hamburgers, and um, and that's you know just kind of because you know he ate everything. Um, so that is basically Shigeru Mizuki in a in a nutshell. Um, anybody got any questions or comments? Yeah, I was interested because he went into some of his 
history works, but you didn't go to show up. No, um, we, we were just talking about this before I started panel. I'm only into the, uh, I've only read the first one. Oh, okay. Show it, uh, just so you know what he's talking about. One of the other things that Shigeru Mizuki did was, um, he writes these fantastic historical pieces, uh, and you know, as, as a manga. And it's not really so much a fictional story, but it, it, it's about Japan, and it's about Showa. Yeah. And Showa's a very good one. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's, a history, it's a history of the Showa period. Right. He yeah. was born at the beginning of, and right. it's both the history of the period and his own autobiography. Right. And it might be the definitive <laughs> history of the period. Yeah. It's it's very like I said. I'm only on the first book, mm -hmm. but it's, it's it's so far I'm I'm really enjoying it and and uh, check that one out. He also did um, uh, uh, he did a biography on Hitler, uh, a manga on Hitler, not of course as a celebration because he's against that. But he thought that, that Hitler was such an interesting person, and he wanted to show how easy it is to get sucked into that world. Because that's the world that he didn't buy into when he was younger, and Japan started their, their, their way to conquest through, through Asia. He didn't buy into that. But Hitler, what he said, it's just amazing how one man can be so persuasive to make you abandon your reason and just get sucked into this thing that really is awful. And there's a great part in Showa where he goes into the build-up in, uh, in Japan into mm -hmm. World War II and how they got sucked into that and the imperialism and all that stuff. Um, any other questions? Comments? Sorry. All good? All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, What's your website? What's that? What's your website? Uh, my YouTube channel is the Unagi Observer. Uh, Please check me. Uh, please check check me out. Please check uh, my video out. Uh, my my channel out. Uh, what I do is I do talk about stuff like this. I do occasional anime reviews, but it's more about uh, culture and impact of of uh, art and things like that in history. Uh, so thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you.